Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In this video, we're going to be discussing the concept of testing forensic evidence, or particularly focusing on trace evidence. Okay, so in forensic science, we have a particular branch of forensics called criminalistics, which relates to the examination of trace evidence. Okay, so the idea of trace evidence, it may be microscopic, it's, it's the, the little bits of evidence that um, get transferred when there is a contact between two objects or two things um, in, in, at a crime scene. So that might be a contact between uh, the victim and the perpetrator. It might be between the, um, the perpetrator and the crime scene. Or maybe it's the, where the, the perpetrator's um, uh, it might be where the perpetrator lives. Um, some trace evidence from them that gets transferred to the crime scene or to the, the victim or to um, a murder weapon or something else like that. That part of the forensic scientist's job <clears throat> is to be able to identify, um, so to locate, identify and test um, trace evidence. And so some of the, the different items that we might come across include things like glass and paint, um, hairs and fibres, um, and then things like bullets, and cartridge cases, so thinking about ballistic, ballistics, you know, so then we're thinking about things like tool marks, you know, maybe in a break and enter where the, there's been some marks from a crowbar that's that has jemmy the kind of the window open. We've got things like soil, we've got biological samples, you name it, lots of different things um, that a criminalist might come across and need to be able to, um, to um, examine. And so there's some different kind of things that we need to consider when that, that process happens um, based on, you know, what items that we're, we're looking at, but also some broader principles about um, how we examine evidence in a way that keeps it in, as intact as possible and also gives us definitive results that we can use in a legal context. Um, okay, and so when we're thinking about trace evidence or when we're thinking about items of evidence in general, um, that we can think that it, it falls into one of two categories, what we call class evidence and what we call individual evidence. Okay, so depending on what type of item and based on how um, closely we can, I, we can narrow down what, what item left that, um, that mark or that contact or that trace. Okay, so class evidence... Um, um, so cannot be um, narrowed down into to an individual. Um, the the idea. Um, okay, so let's look at say um, for example the brand of pen or the color of the paint or something like that that's, that's happened at a crime scene. So being able to actually look at an, to, to, by examination of an item of evidence, let's say you're, you're looking at a scenario where there's a, a threatening note that's been written, okay, um, or a ransom note. You can examine the, the pen and you can do some tests on the ink and you can identify that the ink came from a pilot, you know, ballpoint 0 0.7 millimeter blue pen. Uh, you know, you might be able to narrow down its year of manufacture or which batch it came from or something like that. Um, if you know if there's if there's evidence that leads you that way, um, but that doesn't necessarily narrow you down to a specific pen. Okay, it can get you to a class of pen or a class, you know, a category of that item, but it can't get you any closer than that. Um, that's what class evidence involves. Now, don't I don't want you to get the impression that class evidence is therefore not useful in a forensic context. Far from it. Okay, because um, class evidence may be still quite specific. Um, you know, it might be to a very um, rare item that only a few people have access to, or maybe to the sort of item that um, that only one person in a scenario in, in the given situation actually has. Um, and you know, or we can also consider multiple pieces of class evidence that combine together to give us valuable information. You know, maybe it maybe one item alone isn't very much, but five, six, seven different pieces of class evidence um, connected together can paint a very compelling picture of connections at a crime scene or otherwise. And so, 
Um, whereas you can imagine, if this if we can't narrow down class evidence to a specific individual item or person or things like that, that's where individual evidence can um, so uh, can be uniquely identified. Okay, so this is. Um, there are fewer types of, of evidence that would fall into this category, but some specific ones that you should be familiar with. Okay, so things like the fingerprints, uh, or what I should say is friction ridge prints, which is essentially what your fingerprints and your, your palm prints are all about, is that they actually provide you a source of friction to pick up objects. Um, something you may well have noticed if you've ever tried to pick up things with gloves on. It, it certainly gives a very different experience. Um, and so we also see the same um, uniqueness and in individuality in prints on your palms and on the soles of your feet and so on. Okay? It's not purely on the tips of your fingers. Uh, things like your DNA, um, your handwriting, also um, bear characteristics um, that, are, that can be very individual. So from a forensic point of view that we get different information from different types of evidence um, and that we may um, weigh them differently um, in a forensic context, like in, in court, in a case, um, in terms of um, providing connections between crime scene, victim, perpetrator, murder weapon, those sorts of things. Okay, so they're the sorts of things that we consider in, in terms of what value that the evidence can give us. All right, but so let's say we're in a situation at a crime, we're at a crime scene and we want to identify um, where trace evidence is, or you know, we're looking for things like blood. Maybe we're looking for biological fluids like semen or saliva um, or urine. You know, maybe we're looking for um, gunshot residue. Those, you know, other sorts of types of trace evidence. Okay. Now, some of the there's two main factors that we need to consider in terms of the tests we use to find those things. Okay. And so we there are a range of different tests that we might choose. Um, to find things that, that, you know, people who research in forensics will develop techniques and we need to, to weigh them up carefully on two main criteria. Selectivity and sensitivity. Okay, so selectivity might also be better known perhaps as uh, specificity. Okay, how specific uh, the test is. Um, how specifically will it identify that type of substance or that type of trace? Um, and sensitivity, um, how, um, what amount can it detect? Okay, and so I'd even go to the point of saying then, you know, what's the lower limit? Um, how low can it go before the, t the technique can't detect it anymore? Um, so, you know, the more sensitive it is, the, the smaller the amount that it will pick up, okay? And so we weight these two things together when we're thinking about a technique. And so we, the tests that we use, um, we place into one of two, or we consider in one of two car categories. I know we're doing a lot of um, categorizing in this, but it's just to show you that we, when we have to carefully weigh these things up and look at the balance of how it works. So we talk about um, the tests that we can do at a crime scene or in the lab being presumptive or confirmatory. So a presumptive test is the one that we would do first and then confirmatory is what we would do second, subsequent to that. Um, and so with the first one, we the a test that's presumptive is highly sensitive but not specific or not that selective. So I might just say not very selective. Okay, you, you wouldn't want it to pick up just about everything, but it may um, give you a result for a range of different substances you'd need to be considering. Whereas a confirmatory test is highly selective. It will only detect, will give you a result for that particular substance, but not very sensitive. Okay, so it's a test that you wouldn't use to detect the tiniest trace amount of this substance in a crime scene or on, a, or on, a, on an item, but if you have a, a spot where you believe that trace to be found, you do a confirmatory test, it will be very specific as to whether that thing is there. Okay, so say you're looking for blood. Okay, so you might do a presumptive test first. Okay, so um, presumptive test like this would be, there's one that's called um, luminol. Okay, 
Okay, you may have seen it on the crime shows, it's very visually interesting, because what it does is it fluoresces or it glows, this kind of blue light, um, in the presence of blood. Okay, when all the room lighting is off. Okay, now the thing is that it's very, very sensitive. Um, it will fluoresce with a very small amount of blood, you know, maybe a, a, a trace of blood that, that's been attempted to be um, cleaned up. But it's also will fluoresce with other things, particularly bleach. Okay, and so you can imagine that if someone's tried to clean up a crime scene, bleach is one thing they may well have used. And so you may see patterns on the floor that's actually bleach and not blood. And now that could be innocuous. It might just be that they've cleaned the floor with it that day, um, as opposed to anything more sinister. And so what you would then have to do is then you'd have to follow up with a confirmatory test that will only react with human blood and, um, and that then that will tell you that yes, that is indeed a blood stain, or no, indeed it's not. Okay, if you get a negative result, you can categorically say it is not that thing. Okay, because it's highly selective. Okay, so we consider the balance of these two things in the tests we use to find important trace evidence at a crime scene. <clears throat> but see, then, as you can well imagine, given that these things are never sim overly simple. There, is, there are more things that we need to consider in terms of the tests that we do, and that is, are we destroying um, evidence? And so for us as forensic scientists, we need to consider, okay, is the test that we're about to do going to destroy or damage um, um, or affect the, the item of evidence in any way? So, so destructive is where, um, so the item of evidence um, maybe, it's not, maybe changed, damaged or destroyed. During the test. Sorry that my marker is, is starting to run a little bit low. You just have to bear with me. Okay. But so the, as the name suggests, okay, it's fairly logical that if it's a destructive test, it's something that may destroy the sample. Okay. Um, so it may just be changed in, or altered in some way that, that can't be undone. Um, it may be, a, a part of it may be damaged or it may be completely destroyed. Okay, now this may involve the whole item. Um, so it may involve the whole item or it may simply involve maybe a section or a, a sample from that item. You know, a tiny little section that's been cut off and tested. It doesn't necessarily have to involve um, destroying the whole thing to be considered destructive. Okay, but so then we get to non-destructive tests where we think about it as the opposite. Okay, and so um, the principle is always non-destructive before destructive. Okay, because as you can imagine, if you have um, a very small sample and you have to potentially destroy it in order to get some extra information out of it. You have to do everything before that um, that can be done and that needs to be done and that ought to be done because you can't go back afterwards. You've got to make sure you've exhausted all the possibilities before you um, consider destroying the whole of the sample. Now, that might be slightly different if you only need to destroy a small part of it, but this is the principle we, we follow, is that we do all the possible non-destructive tests first before we do anything that's destructive. Okay. Um, and so now we're going to we're going to list out a couple of examples of these types of tests. Okay, so destructive. So uh, actually, we'll do non-destructive first. Okay, so some examples that we might think about are things like light-based techniques, like microscopy. Um, we've got infrared, which is shortened to IR, spectroscopy. Okay, various kind of things that, that, that might um, fall under that. Okay, um, we've got physical examination. Okay, so actually just observing, taking photos, manipulating manually with tweezers and forceps and other things like that where you're actually, you, you are looking at that item. Now, depending on how fragile that is, that may have, be potentially destructive. Okay, that's, that's not a guarantee there. Um, but generally speaking, if you just having a look first, that's not going to destroy anything. Okay, um, we've also got other techniques like fluorescence, okay, or slash luminescence. Okay, so we're using other light-based 
um, techniques to see um, if it's going to um, if there's going to be any fluorescence or any kind of glowing patterns that might happen. So other things that might be destructive, we've got things like chromatography. We're going to look at chromatography in great detail. Um, and there's more than, like, there's many different types. Um, another technique that we're going to look at is one called electrophoresis. These are both separation techniques for mixtures, so we can identify the components. Um, mass spectrometry is another one. Um, that's destructive, okay, pyrolysis, which is a technique of using heat to break something down. It's often accompanied with um, things like chromatography or mass spectrometry um, as a way of being able to break something down into its components, okay? It's far from an exhaustive list, but that's some examples of destructive tests that a forensic scientist might do. So you can imagine that the, the ones that are over here are the ones that we would refer to first, particularly things like physical examination, it's easy to do that first before you need any instruments. Um, and then we start to move towards destructive tests. You know, is it a mixture we need to separate before we identify components? Do we need have something that we can identify directly? Okay, or do we need to burn it or break it down in order to test it? Okay, we've also got um, another one I'll put here, I almost forgot. We'll just call um, wet chemical techniques. Okay, kind of a bit of a catch-all sort of phrase there, but the idea of, you know, certain kind of solutions or testing um, reagents that we might add to, to um, a, a given sample. Okay, um, the last concept that we're going to address here, I realise this is, um, the video is getting a little bit long, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll keep it short, or we'll shorten it, um, wrap it up very, very soon. Just to introduce this concept, once I get my board a little bit cleaner, of a concept called probative value, probative value, as far as saying, okay, will the test that you do, will the approach that you take actually lend, at, give you useful information? If it doesn't give you useful information, there's very little point in actually doing the test. It may well cost a lot of money in, in manpower, in time, in instruments, in all those sorts of things for little extra information that might add to it. Okay, so when you, we have to weigh up carefully, you know, what's the point of the test that we do, especially when it comes to logistics in terms of, you know, you have lots of different cases to examine, you know, that, that if you invest a lot of time on one particular case, you know, that's taking time away from something else or it's increasing the backlog. So you have to weigh up carefully if it's worth doing it. Um, what information are you likely to gain from it that might um, shed some light on, on the scenario? Okay, if, it, if you have a test that will give, has a high probative value that can tell you lots of useful information, then you go for it. Okay, it's worth it. But tests that have a low probative value or very, or you know, next to no probative value uh, um, are typically not required or things that we would may decide against doing um, for particular items of evidence. Okay, Cause the, and this can vary from case to case depending on the history of the item in question. Okay, you know, if it's something that's been wet, then testing for something that was water soluble is probably not has no probative value because um, it, whatever was there is not going to be there anymore okay and likewise testing for DNA after there's been you know a, a really intense fire is also there's not a lot of probative value because it would have been destroyed or denatured um, you know so that, that there's not a lot of point in actually looking for it or trying to analyze it okay so it it's just another thing uh, amongst the many that we've looked at in this video that a forensic scientist needs to weigh up and consider as to the choice of the tests that we do and what value that it provides. Okay, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.